What I shared with you this morning earlier and what I'm about to share with you now are the two, there are two thoughts or two truths that are so foundational to life. They just affect everything in life. And, but it doesn't, well, I should say, but it doesn't immediately do that. <clears throat> You'll have to think about it and meditate on it. And what I'm going to share with you again, I'm going to share with you some seeds that you'll need to go and think about. But as you think about them, and as you watch people and interact with people, you'll be able to see these truths. And then before long, it will begin to affect the way you think and the way you respond to things. <clears throat> I want to talk with you about purpose. And the reason it's so important is because purpose predetermines every single thing you do every day. I'll give you an example because that's the way it works with God. Take a look at this passage in um, Acts. <clears throat> the disciples are responding to being told not to preach anymore in Jesus' name. You remember that? Or to heal in Jesus' name. And their response to it is this passage. And they don't get upset about it. They're not troubled over it. In fact, they see it as the hand of God working out his purposes. Look what they say. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. <clears throat> now if you just to kind of walk you through what he's saying, there were gathered together. It would be like you're, you gathering um, or a mother hen gathering chicks, <clears throat> you know, the chicks are being gathered. He's, they're saying God got Pontius Pilate and Herod and the people and he's gathering them all together against Jesus. That God is doing this. Now notice what he goes on to say. Whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Purpose predetermines everything. <clears throat> when you do something, what you think the purpose is of doing it, that's going to govern how you do it. Now, you don't really think about it. You just do it. <clears throat> and that's true for all of us. But purpose is one of these huge, big words that just encompasses your whole life. If I ask you, like, what is the purpose of your life? And do you live your life with purpose? And what is that purpose? What's the overarching purpose of your marriage, your parenting, your going to church, your work? There should be an overarching purpose <clears throat> that affects every bit of that. In fact, there is one. For instance... <clears throat> what is your purpose? Is your purpose to be happy? A lot of people, that's their purpose. Everything they do, they do to be happy. If it's not making them happy, they will try to change it until they're happy. <clears throat> because their purpose is to be happy. I would guess that's probably most people's purpose. You know. Um, how about be successful? There's a lot of people that that's their purpose. They get up in the morning and they're just thinking, make money. What can I do to be successful? Or to be significant, maybe. That might be another one. Be significant. Be popular. Well, I want to be somebody. I mean, when I die, I want a lot of people to come to my funeral. You know. <clears throat> I, I don't know. People do things for different reasons, don't they? But it's the purpose that really predetermines why they do it. Okay, what you have on the screen before you now, according to the Bible, I believe this is what a believer's purpose is. The overarching purpose is to know God the Father and to know the Son. Now, let me give you the scripture behind that so that you'll know I'm not just coming up with this. <clears throat> I'm not trying to give you my ideas, although it's what I my opinion that these are what this is what the Bible tells us and that's this 
Look at Genesis chapter 1, 27. I'm going to kind of build from the beginning and take you through what took place. Big picture. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Adam and Eve. The first human beings. Were created with the capacity to know God. There in the garden, they knew the Father and they knew the Son. The Son was the tree of life. <clears throat> they had that available to them. That's what it was all about, was knowing the Father and knowing the Son. Because that's what he made us for. But we know what happened. In fact, take a look at what it means to be in the image of God. Do you remember where it says, Let us make man in our image. The Father and the Son are in relationship with each other. The reason... God made us with the capacity to know God was because the Father and the Son know each other. But notice what he says here in Genesis 2.18. The Lord said it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Why wasn't it good? The reason it wasn't good for man to be alone was because he couldn't know the Father and the Son if he was alone. I'm going to let you think about that. Why would that be so? <clears throat> How could you know the love of the Father for the Son and the love of the Son for the Father and what it's like to be in a relationship without being in a relationship <clears throat> that has intimacy where you know one another and you get to know each other and you react and respond to one another. So the reason he made male and female was so that you could know God. So you could know the Father and know the Son. That's really big. It's like an ocean. At first you hear that, and I know you feel like you're just looking at a wading pool. And it's not impressive. Because I know that's what I thought. I started looking at that and I thought, hmm, okay, I need to think about this. Lord, would you please teach me about this? And the more I thought about it, thought about how to know the Father and the Son, <clears throat> all of a sudden I am in way over my head. And I realized this is going to swallow me up. It's going to swallow up everything that I am. And you'll see why as I keep going. My point is this. God's purpose, that we might know the Father and know the Son, required relationship. And that's why he made male and female in his own image. In Genesis 2.24 we read, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. You see, the whole idea was that God's purpose from the first was to make two creatures who bore his image the capacity to know and to be intimate and experience fellowship with him. That he put us together so we could, in that relationship, know the Father and the Son <coughs> as we knew each other. Now... <clears throat> That's going to take a ton of meditation for you to grasp that. Because it did me too. Now I'm a little slow, so it may be faster for you. It took me weeks. Seriously. I meditated on this for weeks. It's all I did in the morning. I just get up in the morning and scratch my head. And ask Jesus to help me understand this. <clears throat> going off a verse, which I'm going to show you in a minute, that's really the one that started it. But here's a thought. If he created us so that we might know him, know the Father and the Son, then that means everything that's ever happened in the history of mankind is for that purpose. Because his purpose predetermines everything he does. So that means that for us to know the Father and the Son, it required the loss of the capacity to know the Father and the Son. 
And you know how that was lost. By sin, at the fall. Notice, the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you will surely die. You see, the fall of man wasn't the end of God's purpose. The fall of man was absolutely necessary to God's purpose. Because how is the Son going to demonstrate His love for the Father? <clears throat> By obeying His Father's command to give up His life and give eternal life to everybody that God gave Him. The cross is all about the love of the Son for the Father. You want to know how much the Son loves the Father? Look at the cross. You want to know how much the Father loves the Son? <clears throat> Just listen to the command when the Father tells the Son to go die for you and for me. That's the love of the Father revealed in the Son. And you get to know God when you look at the cross because you're looking at the relationship between the Father and the Son over you. Whereas you're not the big deal. He's the big deal. They are the big deal, I should say. The Father and the Son. But um, the love of God for His Son and the love of the Son for His Father and thus the outpouring of the Holy Spirit couldn't possibly know, be known without the loss of the capacity to know God. Because <clears throat> what is God going to do? He's going to restore it. I mean, look what happened here in Genesis 3.24. We all know he drove man out of, the east, out of the garden and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. I mean, basically what happened was this. Adam and Eve forsook God's purpose to know the Father and the Son. When the devil came and tempted them, I want you to think through the temptation. Here's what he said. Uh, you don't think God really meant don't eat of the tree. And notice what he's saying. It's what you think is really more important than what God thinks. You know what you feel about this is really more important than what God feels about this. See, what he was trying to do was get him to switch purposes. Satan was giving him a new purpose and seeing if he would bite for it. And that was that I've been created to know me. And what I think and feel. And that's my overarching purpose. Instead of, I'm here to know what the Father and the Son think and feel. <clears throat> so when, so basically what happened when Adam and Eve sinned, they died and we all died with them and with one lethal act of individuality and hostility, we lost the ability to know God. But not only that, we lost the ability to know each other. We, we lost the ability to know anybody but ourselves. In fact, that became our purpose. The moment you're born, you, you come into this world self-centered. Isn't that true? Instead of God-centered. It's like we all became spiritual narcissists. And every relationship was damaged. And we lost the capacity to know God the Father and to know the Son. All of mankind. Nobody knows Him. In fact, that's exactly what we read in Romans chapter 3. No one seeks for God. No one knows God. <coughs> no one does good. Not even one. There's none righteous. We're just wrapped up in ourselves. So, I want you to notice what happened. Now, what I'm about to tell you is extremely volatile. Okay? I'm just warning you ahead of time. <clears throat> When Adam sinned, 
All of mankind lost the image of God. There is no one born in the image of God. You know, we think these innocent babies are born and they have the image of God. No, they don't. Notice what it says in Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness. And watch the contrast. In the likeness of God, he created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man. That's Adam. In the day when they were created. When Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness. according to his image and named him Seth. What is the writer trying to tell us? Not trying. What is he telling us? <clears throat> Adam was made in the image of God. Then he sinned. And his very first child no longer had the image of God. It had the image of Adam. And you know how you know that you were born in the image of Adam and not God? It's because you live your life for yourself. And your overarching purpose. I mean, look what it says in Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Do you see how sweeping that is? Every intent of the thoughts of the heart. This is the image of Adam. Only evil. So there's no good. Nothing about God. Continually. There is no image of God. We are not born in the image of God. Anymore. There's only two men that have ever been born in the image of God. Do you know who they are? Adam and Jesus. Praise God for Jesus. <laughs> Why did he send Jesus? A second Adam, a second man created in the image of God. Why did he do that? Well, the reason is he sent him so that he could restore the capacity to know the Father and the Son. He would completely change the way we live our lives. So here's what I want you to notice, because I want, to see, want you to see the contrast. And you'll be able to identify with this. In fact, the more you think about it, the more you're going to see it. What is the sinner's overarching purpose? What was, after Adam sinned, what became our overarching purpose over our marriages, our parenting, our childrening? If that's a word. <coughs> Whatever it is. It was this. It's to know ourselves. You know how you know that? It's because when things happen, you always ask, what do I think or feel? Isn't that true? I mean, you're even sitting here listening to me asking what you think or feel. And you can't help it. It just happens. However, I lo however long I talk, you're going to be sitting there once it gets past what you think or feel it should be. You're going to be sitting there reacting on the basis of what you think or feel. You've always done it most of your lives because it's the purpose of your life. It's your overarching purpose. What do I think or feel? That's the question we ask. How does it affect me? Is, is, is this true or is this just only me that thinks this way? <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of thinking you're like me. But that's how I've lived so much of my life. My wife says something, and boom, what do I think or feel about it? Somebody does something, boom, what do I think or feel about it? It's not like I even have to tell myself to think or feel about this. It just, it just comes out. It's just like in me. Your husband says something you don't like. Well, what do you feel about that? <laughs> and you think about what you feel about it, and then you let him know what you feel about it. Typically. 
Or here's what I think. I mean, look how foundational this is. Look how over, just how sweeping it is over our lives, how much it affects. Now, here's what I want you to notice, and this is profound. Every time you ask the question, when something happens, what do I think or feel? It always, 100% of the time, leads to separation from God. You'll have to think about that. When Adam asked the question, what do I think or feel? Because Satan asked him to think about what he thought or feel. Where did it lead him? Separation from God. He died. The moment he went down that path, he was a goner. And we've all been goners ever since. But not only does it lead to separation from God... It leads to separation from people. When somebody does something or somebody says something, I just want you to think about someone doing something in your life in the last 24 hours. Got it there? <laughs> Get that situation in your mind? If you responded with what you thought or felt, you were dealing with being separated from them. Because if it goes with what you like or don't like or what you feel or it's not what you think, it's going to lead you to separate from them. I mean, just think about it. If your parents' kids tell you something that's different than what you think it should be, and then you think about what you think about it or feel about it, does it lead you to union with your parents or does it lead you to get upset at your parents? It leads you to get upset at your parents. Doesn't it? A couple in a marriage. A brother and a sister in the church. Something happens. And what's the first thing we do? What do I think or feel about it? We even come to church and do that. How many times have you gone home after church and on the way home talked about what you thought or felt about the sermon? Or the morning? Or the music. It's just interesting, isn't it? Have you ever stopped to think how much we do this? Now consider this. Jesus is the image of God. <coughs> the only other one beside Adam. Look at Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. Hebrews 1.3. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Now watch John 17, 1, 2, and 3. Here's the verse that caught my attention. I thought, whoop, I'm going to need to think about this. And I'm almost sure you've read this verse before. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that, to, now watch this carefully, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and the one whom he sent. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And what is eternal life? It's to know the Father and to know the Son. So if you've been born again, if you believe in Jesus, you have received the capacity once again to know the Father and to know the Son. And that is your purpose in life. Because that is life. That's an ocean. That is not a waiting pool.
You see, what God was doing in Christ was restoring what Adam lost. The capacity to know God the Father and the Son. The capacity to experience eternal life. So, the only, see this is what's so amazing about Jesus. Is now to come to Jesus and believe in Jesus. The whole purpose isn't to get saved. I mean, it is part of it. In fact, to know God the Father and to be restored to be able to know the Father and the Son is to be saved from yourself. You see, what changes is this. Our purpose completely changes. And the redeemed sinner's overarching purpose becomes to know God the Father and to know the Son. Now, if that's our purpose, our questions change when things happen. What were our questions when the overarching purpose was to know us? What do I think? And what do I feel? So now what do you think the questions are? <clears throat> That's exactly right. What does the Father and the Son think or feel? When's the last time you asked that question when something happened? Just asking. I, I'm asking you because I asked me. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness. I have wasted so much of my life with the wrong purpose. I just hadn't thought this through. <laughs> I should be asking, how does what I do or say affect the Father and the Son? I mean, if, if, if you say you know somebody, what do you mean by that? Usually it means I know how they feel or what they think about something. If you were to ask me, what, do, what does Alma think about, pick a subject, if I knew her and I know her, I think I'd be able to tell you that. Because with my experience with her, I have learned what she thinks or feels. So when something happens, many times when things happen with her, I ask myself, I wonder what she thinks and feels <laughs> to get to know her. Because it's important for me to know her. She's important in my life. But the real questions I ought to be asking are these questions. What does the father and the son think or feel? What is, in fact, not only that, but to ask, what can I know about the father and the son? Or I've asked questions like this. So when something happens, father, what can I know about your love for the son who lives in me as the son responds to you and this situation, as he responds to this situation by knowing what you think, Lord, help me get into that thinking. Let me get into your mind. What do you think when this person says this? What do you think when th this person does this? What did you think when Judas betrayed you? You know what I can tell you he thought? Because we, we know that from the scriptures. What he thought was, before Judas betrayed him, I am not a victim. My father told me to go lay down my life. I will not be a victim. Judas, what you do, go and do quickly. Because I'm not a victim. This is not going to happen to me. I'm going to cause it to happen. Why? Because my father commanded me that I, could lay, I was to go and lay down my life and then take it up again. This the father commanded me. And why did the father command that? Do you know, do you know God? Do you know why the father commanded that? I mean, we have eternal life. We have the capacity to know why the father commanded the son to do that. You know why he did that? It's because he loves his son. And he wanted to make much of his son and glorify his son in giving us the ability to know the Father and the Son. Chew on that for a while. Wow. That's why the son prays, what we just read in those verses, the son prayed and said, 
Father, the time has come for you to glorify your son. <laughs> and he's talking about the cross, going to the cross. And whenever he told Judas to go and betray him, here's what he says next. Now is the Son of Man glorified. Why is he glorified? It's because he's pleasing the Father and he knows what the Father thinks about this. Because the Son loves the Father and he knows the Father. Have you ever gotten into their minds over the cross? When you read the Bible, do you read the Bible to know the Father and the Son and to know what they think? Or do you read the Bible to know what you think and feel about the Bible? I mean, just these verses right here, I, I'm pretty sure there's some verses we read just a moment ago that you've probably even changed what they said because it didn't match what you thought or felt. I mean, like, for instance, let's just back up here. How about this one? Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. What do you think about that? Just, just read it. Well, if you're like me and like most self-centered, man-centered people, we will say, why didn't you just give everybody to him? Why doesn't he give eternal life to everybody? I mean, he has authority to give eternal life. Why doesn't he just give eternal life to everybody? I mean, this is terrible. There's something in my self-centered mind that says, God, what are you thinking? That's not fair. Now, why would I feel that way? Because when I'm reading God's word, you know what's most important to me? Are you beginning to figure it out? What's most important to me is what I think or feel about what God thinks and feels. I'm more concerned about knowing myself than I am about knowing God. And I will worship me before I will worship God. That's the main theological debate problem. Just pick your denomination. <laughs> because all these denominations are all there because they're all focused on what they think or feel about the Bible and what God thinks or feels. What should we be doing when we come to Scripture like this? What questions should we be asking? What does God think? <laughs> it tells me what God thinks. <laughs> right there. And it's not what I think. But then the Bible tells me my thoughts are not his thoughts and my ways are not his ways. Like, duh. <laughs> I should have figured that one out. <clears throat> but you see, these are the questions we ought to be asking. <clears throat> and watch how profound this is. If we will ask these questions when things happen, it will always lead us to union with God. 100% of the time. Guess what else it will do? It will lead us to union with people. Because even the most horrendous act against my body that could possibly be done does not thwart my purpose to know the Father and the Son. Because when I know the Father and the Son and a person is about to kill me, you know what will come out of my mouth when I think about what God thinks? It will be forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because that's what God thinks. And I will see the love of Christ and the compassion of Christ for a bound up sinner that needs to know the love of God while he's killing somebody. That maybe while that's happening, God might cause that man to open up his mind and look and see what's really going on and go, indeed, this must be the son of God. We would never react that way unless we knew God. You have to be asking the right questions. 
So I'm going to close with Paul, <coughs> just Paul and John, just to show you I didn't make this up. <laughs> Look what Paul writes in Philippians. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So what's his purpose in life in everything that's happening? It's to know Christ. For whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I can gain Christ. In every situation, this it was an overarching purpose for Paul. And that I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know him. There it is, second time. Know him and the power of his resurrection. And look what he's saying. In my... In my life, I'm going to know the power of the resurrection. I'm going to know Jesus as God raises me up. And I'm going to know the fellowship of his sufferings in every suffering. The purpose of the suffering is to know him and what Jesus went through when he was suffering. And to know how to go to the son when I'm suffering. And then the son responds to the father in me. In the midst of my suffering, I know that God is praised. And as I worship him in my suffering, like Christ worshiped him in his suffering, then I know what Christ went through and I know his heart for his father. And then I see the father's response to his son and he rejoices in his son. And I experience the joy of the Lord, which is my strength. Because I know the joy of the Lord, because I'm knowing the father and the son in the suffering. Being conformed to his death, he's going to even know him in his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So, think about how you can know Christ. This is your assignment for Sunday afternoon, okay? When people reject you, how can you know the Father and the Son? How would you process that? You do it this way. Was Jesus ever rejected? Sure he was. So how do you know what the Father and the Son think when you're rejected? You look and see what the Father and the Son thought when Jesus was rejected. And you look and see, how did Jesus respond? What did he do with the Father? How did he respond to the Father? How did the Father respond to him when Jesus was rejected? You see... And by the way, we have that in the scriptures. It's not like you're having to make that up. You can read the scriptures and see what they did. Or when suffering from sickness or pain. Now, did Jesus ever suffer from sickness? No. Did he ever suffer from pain? Yes. What did he do when he was in pain? You want to know what you want to know Jesus? Do, when you're in pain, do what Jesus did when he was in pain. And you will experience what Jesus experienced. Because he went to the Father for comfort in his pain. And what did the Father do? Sent angels in the garden to comfort him and strengthen him just before he went to the cross. He was in such agony and pain as he bore our sin. And the reason we read those passages there isn't to know what we think or feel about it. It's to know what he thinks and feels about it. You see, you see what I'm saying? It's kind of a whole new paradigm. You read the Bible totally different. You look at your life totally different. You look at what people do to you totally different. Because you're asking a whole new set of questions. And it's taking you down a different road. Whenever you don't like something, how can you know the Father and the Son when you're in a situation that you don't like it? Well, you look and see, what did Jesus do when he didn't like it? Did Jesus like everything? No. I mean, even when God shows him the cup, what does he say? <sighs> Lord, if, if there's another way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours. Yeah, I can pray that prayer. You can pray that prayer. But what is ultimately what are you coming down to to know about Jesus? He wants the Father's will more than he wants his own. Are you there? If it means suffering. 
and pain. Because he knows the Father's going to comfort him. And by the way, when the Father comforts you in your pain, guess what all that's for? So you can know the Father. And know his compassion. And know his mercy. And know his comfort. And know his consolation. And know his affection for his son. Because his son is in you. He's doing that to you, not because of you, but because of his son who lives in you. You're finding out what the father thinks about the son when that happens. I, this is just amazing. When you're reading the Bible, you ask, what does the father and the son think? Don't read the Bible and think, what do I think about this? It'll always lead you to separation. But you ask, what can I learn? How about praying? When you're praying, how much of your praying is based on what you think or feel? I mean, most of us, we have our prayer time. We go, well, how do I feel like praying in this situation? <laughs> Instead of doing that, you need to be asking, Father, what are you thinking about this situation so I can pray according to your will? Do you know that Jesus never prays anything that's not according to the will of God? That's because he loves his Father. And he knows what the will of the Father is. And he prays that way. How about when you're serving others? Laying down your life for others. I mean, there's, we could go on and on, but the whole idea is this. Your purpose is that you may know Him. So you ask, Father, Son, what do you think? Father, Son, what do you feel? Father, Son, what can I learn about you? Father, Son, how can I make much of you? The reason I put that last one is because that's what the Father thinks. Paul writes in, to the Colossians, he says, I pray this always. I pray that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you can walk in a manner worthy, pleasing him in all respects and bearing fruit in every good work. And then he tells us what the Father's will is in verses 19 and 20, that he made him his head over the church so that Jesus Christ might be first place in everything. You know what the Father's will is in everything? You know what he thinks? Here's what he's thinking. I'm going to make much of Jesus in this situation. You know what we typically think? How can I make much of me in this situation? <laughs> can you see the difference, the contrast? And it all has to do with purpose because purpose predetermines everything. It determines our reactions. Father, Son, how can I know and reveal your love? So Paul finishes. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect or mature, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. Why was he laid hold of by Christ? Eternal life. That he could know the Father and the Son. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, which I want to suggest you do that. Just forget all the times that you've always asked, what do I think or feel? I mean, you've done it a lot. Well, don't let that bum you. Don't let it just discourage you that, oh my goodness, here I am this old and I'm just now hearing this. Are you kidding me? <coughs> forget what lies behind. Now you've heard. Amen. From this point forward, press on. Amen. You were made to know the Father and the Son. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to press on to know the Father and the Son in everything I do. And then when I get to the end of my race... I will go into the presence of God and I will see him as he is and I will know him fully. That's where we're going. We're just in process. That's why Jesus saved us. Not so we could know ourselves, but so we could know him. So what do you think about this? Oh, no, that was a stupid question. <laughs> I joke, but not. 
<laughs> what do you think? What do you think God thinks about what you've just heard? It's true. Think it's true? He's glad that we're hearing the truth. Yeah, I think so. I think. <laughs> In my humble opinion. <laughs> Do you believe this is true? Do you have eternal life? Yes. You know how you'll know. You'll start asking the right questions when things happen. It takes practice, I can tell you. It takes a lot of repentance. I'm still repenting. I can see why Paul said, I have not yet attained it. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that a little bit encouraging to all of us? <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, I don't have to arrive today on April the 10th and finally fully know God. <laughs> no, we're just going to press on and not be discouraged. But let's repent of living our lives, asking what we think or feel when things happen. Now, here's one of the last thing I'll say to you. Now that we've had this conversation, you will notice how everybody else does it wrong. It's amazing. <clears throat> you'll hear somebody just upset and fried about something. And you'll go, you know, he's reacting to what he thinks or feels. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'll see it. You'll just see it, just like that. Your kids, they'll be reacting to you, and you'll go... Pfft. They're reacting by what they think or feel. Oh, yeah, I got that. Your husband will say something. Your wife will say something. Yeah. Remember what Norm said? <laughs> you know, if, oh, man, we can see it in other people. So use those, others, those other people as you're judging them. Judge yourself and you'll begin to learn it. Remember what Jesus taught? If you see a speck in your brother's eye, First pull out the log out of your eye and you'll be able to help your brother. In other words, judge yourself first. So anytime you see it happening in somebody else, just notice it. It's okay to notice it. And then begin to then turn it around and go, yeah, I'm like that. In fact, I'm kind of right now thinking and feeling about what I think about them thinking and feeling. <laughs> yep, I'm doing it too. I wonder how I can know God the Father in this situation where I'm aware of what they're thinking and feeling. You see, Dave? It's a whole new perspective on the verse that says take every thought captive. Sure it does. Did you know in 1 John chapter 4, go read 1 John 4 now, and you know what the big issue is in 1 John 4 and 5? It's whether they know God. It's not whether they're saved. Everybody who knows God loves Everybody who doesn't love does not know God. For God is love. And if you knew God and what he thought and what he felt, you'd forgive and you'd love each other. Just that simple. Wow, this is profound. So I'm still working on it. I hope I, you will now begin to work on it and you know, pray about it and just let Jesus teach you about himself. Next time we see each other, either here or in glory. I'm going to be so excited. I know I am. You're going to know him better than you would have had I not been here today. I'm going to trust God for that. Because you're going to think different.